I was telling everyone that you're not really a guest, that you're a member of the family. <laughs> Is the network okay? Can you hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you. It's okay. 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 Yes, please enjoy this, my beautiful all back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone. It's Ifeiwa Omesiete, and she is the one and only kid nutritionist. The one you take your child to when you have any questions about his nutrition, about his weight, about his feeding, whatever it is, she has the answers. And then you know the best part? She doesn't work alone. She works with the almighty God. So, yes, so. <laughs> so she will definitely get you to where you need to be with your child's nutrition. So today, we are talking about thriving with allergies. And the focus today is on nutrition. You know, when we find out those allergies, whether through elimination, through tests, or whatever, you, we take it off. And then sometimes we forget that it's not just food that you're taking away. You're taking away nutrition, a fundamental source of nutrition. So it's very important that you replace with another food that has um, similar nutrients as the one you're taking away. So today she will be sharing in depth about this and I'll do my best not to interrupt her. I will ask her questions at the end of this. Please so if he <laughs> take it away. All, All right. right. Good afternoon everyone. Hope everybody is doing great this wonderful what are we Tuesday afternoon. Yes. So my name is Ife Ma I'm a nutritionist nutritionist just like we took has said. Um, primary job is to help your children with any nutritional needs that they have. And today we're focusing on allergies. So I feel like um, with allergies, there's just something really, really um, interesting about it. Um, and why I say interesting is mainly because sometimes people think of it as a defeat or a loss, right? Just like any kind of um, illness or sickness or anything that somebody has, the first instinct is, I'm at a loss. Oh, my child is not going to be able to enjoy um, all the things that everybody else has. Or my child is not going to be able to eat biscuits. Or my child is not going to be able to have cookies or any of those things. If you've been following in KG long enough, you will know that your child is never at a loss. I mean, the things that you've come up with and created and just shown us that there is no way that your child will ever be at a loss with anything all you have to do is get creative and have it at the back of your mind that as long as you have the fundamentals, the fundamentals are basically the ingredients that you need, you can come up with anything. That being said, what are those fundamentals? Now, there are known allergies, right? There are nut allergies, there are um, shellfish allergies, fish allergy, dairy allergy, gluten allergies. And then if you leave the food bracket, you've got like dust, mold, um, seasonal allergies. You know, the list is really endless. I've, I've heard of things like people not being able to touch water. Um, there's allergies where you can't, um, what's it called? You can't even let your own sweat touch you. So the body is amazing. And sometimes these um, immune responses, which technically that's what allergies are, can manifest in different ways. So how do we get the fundamentals for food? The first thing, just like Nkechi said, is identify what it is. Um, a lot of the times, right, we sometimes mistake allergies for intolerances. And I think it's important to be able to decipher between the two, because when you're able to decipher between the two, you know how effective you can be in terms of either elimination or replacing. So an allergy is an immune response. And, and, and an intolerance is a digestive response. Now, when you're able to decipher the two, then one thing comes to mind. And for me, I always tell par um, parents to have this in mind. If it's an immune response, it is easier to deal with it than when it is an intolerance. Sometimes you think it's the other way around. Here's why. With an immune response, 
the reaction is immediate. So you don't even bother attempting or trying to even play around with it. You just know that, okay, I'm removing this from the table. But when it's an intolerance, which is a digestive response, it can take some time, right? It can take some time for whatever it is to actually fully manifest. So sometimes you don't even know that you're playing that game with, the, with any particular food in general or any substance in food in general. So like I said, know the difference. And once you're able to decipher which one it is, still take that food off. So once again, you want to make sure that you eliminate the food. But in eliminating the food, you want to make sure that you're substituting it and replacing it with something that is equally as nutritionally balanced or, as, or even more. Now, when you're replacing um, food, don't replace it by, how do I put this? Don't replace it by individual item. So, for example, you have a child who's allergic to milk and at the back of your head, what you are trying to do is, I need to replace milk in their diet. What can I give my child that is milk? What can I, what can I give that child that is supposed to be milk form or, or we still have milk taste? You failed it from there. Because when you start doing that, you automatically limit yourself in terms of replacement. Instead, your focus should be on what nutrients in milk should I be trying to replace? What nutrients does milk have should I be trying to replace for the child? For example, the major reason why any of us drink milk is for calcium, for protein, and if you're lucky, vitamin D fortified milk, right? Because not all milks are vitamin D fortified. So that's what you're kind of, that's what you're actually trying to replace. Now in doing that, you're switching to what other foods Will my child take, or what can I use for my child that contain calcium, that contain um, protein, and can also contain vitamin D? Now, the food that we have in the world, not a lot of them contain vitamin D primarily as its source. So automatically, you're not at a loss. By just standing outside in our beautiful African sun, you will get the vitamin D. We have been blessed enough by God with our skin color, with our melanin. So you'd actually get your vitamin D if you have the right kind of sunlight. So again, you are not even replacing vitamin D from milk with food. You're replacing it by just letting your child go outside, get to breathe, hang out, play out. That's um, salt. Now, how do I replace the calcium that I'm losing in milk? There are, <coughs> there are 1,001 foods that contain calcium in it in varying quantities. Now here's another catch. When it comes to, <clears throat> sorry, when it comes to the nutrition of, um, when it comes to absorption of nutrients in the body, the body has this, this funny way of taking things in, right? So for example, the calcium, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, let me get water to drink. All right. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. Uh, Okay, I think my throat is clear now. So when, what the body does with certain nutrients, for example, things like calcium, um, there are certain foods that contain calcium, which we may be familiar with. So let me give an example. Some green vegetables contain calcium in them, right? However, the problem with that is absorption and bioavailability to the body. Bioavailability simply means how much from that um, nutrients that I'm getting from that nutrient source will my body actually take in? With vegetables that have calcium, the body doesn't absorb them as well. You need either like a precursor or another enzyme to encourage that absorption into the body. So in trying to replace calcium from milk, which is easier for the body to absorb, with like a plant-based or like a green vegetable, let me say a green vegetable, because other plants, you can actually still get the, vitamin, the, the calcium from it. But with like the green vegetables, in your mind, you're like, well, if I give you ugu, you'll be all right. If I give you, uh, what's it called, kale, or give you this, you'll be okay. And then one day you take the child to the hospital and you find out that the calcium levels are not as high. That's mainly because you haven't been giving them, remember I talked about vitamin D earlier, they haven't been getting the sunlight. 
And that's why um, today, even with dairy milk, right, they're actually fortifying with vitamin D because research has shown that over time, um, the level of absorption of calcium, not even just from milk, but from other food sources is not as high without vitamin D. So you see why it is really, really important to be able to understand the replacement process because sometimes in your mind you are thinking about plant-based milk right and unfortunately a lot of plant-based milks don't contain a lot of calcium in them in fact if you think about things like coconut milk you might maybe even get less than one gram of calcium from coconut milk right or you might even get less than one gram of tiger nut milk here's what i suggest if you are on that route of trying to replace um, dairy milk with cow milk. Aim for combination. Aim for um, um, combining different variants of plant-based milk. And in fact, one thing I love about Nigeria and how far we've come and how little we know about the things that we grow here is 500 years ago, 100 years ago, they got these things down right. Do you know, in fact, I think it was last month that I found out that there are parts of Nigeria, especially in the northern regions, where they actually herd cows. Listen to this, so they are the ones that herd cows, yet they don't drink the milk from the cow. They herd the cows, but they don't drink the milk from the cow. And the reason why they don't drink the milk from the cow is because that is their source of income. So they sell it to somebody else so they can make money. Now, what do they drink? They drink kumu. What is kumu? Tiger nut milk, coconut milk, and dates. So it's, it's sometimes we think that now us no past, or we are the ones that know better. And then you have a child who has an allergy, and you're like, okay, I need to buy you. Okay, what I need to get you is like almond milk, or I need to now replace it with like soy milk. And I get that question a lot. I get a lot of people asking me, okay, which brand of almond milk do you prefer? And I'm like, why, why, why are you even traveling so far? Why are you even going so far? You know? Um, in case, are you taking notes of questions? Because I kind of want to just... Yes, I, I, yes I am. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking notes. Okay. Um, so why are we even going so far? Where coconut is right down the alley, tiger nut is right down the road, bamba is just off the shore somewhere, you know, dates, we have them in abundance. So again, when you are trying to swap out nutrients, always aim, um, aim not necessarily to replace one food item with another food item that is similar to it, but trying to replace the nutrients that are in those food items. That's really, really important. It helps you to automatically switch your mindset in seeing a variety of foods now versus seeing the limitations that you think you may have when it comes to that child's diet. I think it's exceptionally important that we do that when it comes to swapping out foods. Another thing that I always suggest is seek guidance. Um, no, no one lives in isolation. No one lives in, in, in a box somewhere. Seek guidance, seek help. You find out that, or maybe you've, you've done elimination method or you've kept a log for some time, seek guidance and seek help. However, in seeking that guidance and in seeking that help, nobody understands the symptoms of your child better than you do. I will repeat that. No one understands the symptoms or the outcomes of your child better than you do. So even in seeking advice and trying to get help, make sure you as a parent are doing research. I think a lot of us fail in that aspect. And it's not that it's our fault or it's not that we don't want to try. But you see, when you don't do your own research against information that you get from either a professional, including myself, or against anybody that you get help from, you, you tend to be a, for lack of a better word, a follow-follow. And when you follow-follow or you are just following and listening to the instructions somebody has passed across to you and you don't receive the outcome expected, the immediate thing is to go back to the person and tell the person it didn't work. However, that person doesn't know, you know, unless, and it's very hard to get a very thorough, um, what's the word I'll use, a very thorough professional. Not that the person doesn't choose to or not want to, 
but that person is probably attending to a thousand and one patients aside your child and so you as the parents do your due diligence to present it almost on a platter of gold so that when the person is giving you advice or giving you context or even telling you okay let's try it this way you actually get to a space where it makes so much sense to you that when the person says, okay, let's remove this, you're like, okay, can I remove this? But can we also try and keep this? Because I've read that. And then it also shows that you're ready to work with the individual. You're ready to work with the professional or whoever it is that you seek their guidance. Because again, the mistake we keep making is you go take information somebody has said, run with it, and then you find out that in, your, in the case of your particular child, in the case of their specific allergy, or in the case of uh, the intolerance, it's not the same. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about, and I'll use a personal um, experience with that. So um, my, my oldest child, she's four now, and when I had her at about 10 weeks, 10, is it 10 weeks? No, 10 days old. Um, at, I think that night, none of us slept. She was itching like crazy. And there were just red dots all over her entire body. And I couldn't figure out, you know, what it was. I just felt, okay, maybe the, cloth, the, the outfit she was wearing was making her uncomfortable or something. A year down the line, we find out that she has atopic dermatitis. In fact, not even a year down the line. I think probably at about um, four months or three months, I find out she has atopic dermatitis. And in my mind, I'm like, what, what, is, it, what is that? What does that even mean? I mean, yes, I've heard of allergies, I've heard of things that people can have, but what is atopic dermatitis? So I went ahead to start reading things up. And in reading things up, I found out that it can actually be caused by either um, an allergic reaction or, um, you know, maybe like coming in contact with particular clothes or things like that. And... And this, is, and this is why I love why um, Inkechi introduced that. I don't work alone, I work with God. Prior to having children, I had entered into a covenant with God for something. So I've been an asthmatic patient for over a decade. And sometimes I ask myself whether the thing is even going to subside or not. I know what steroids can do to your body. I know what the amount of medication I've had to undergo or be subdued to as a child. When I tell you that, um, when I tell you that, I, have, I, was, I was at the point where medication, oral medication was not working. They, they had to be injecting me almost every day. That's how bad it was. So in growing up, I had vowed that if I was going to have children, none of my children will experience such a heartache. So I entered into a covenant with God and I told him that it's not happening. Whatever curse this is, whatever issue this is, it needs to stop here. It stops with me and it's not moving forward. So when I found out that my daughter had a topic dermatitis, I went back to God and I asked him and I said, but bros, we are agreed now. Why all of a sudden was this one? Why are they speaking English for me? You know, and then what I heard in my spirit was, you are not listening. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. So let's keep going. So I kept, you know, trying to, <clears throat> we went from one dermatologist to the other. We went from one doctor to the other, you know, trying to find, what was the problem and what was causing it. So we removed things like carpet, to remove things like, uh, mm. what else did I not remove? All the removables, all the typical things you would think about in allergies. And I hadn't introduced her to like not, uh, yes, we were taking milk and she loved milk. Oh my goodness, she loved it. I gave it to her in any form. Milk, gave it to her in, in cheese, um, I just think of anything that looks like milk or resembles milk. She ate it and ate it with joy. <laughs> you know, ate it with joy and pride. You know? And it still didn't click, but we continued the journey. Now, things started getting worse. We left atopic dermatitis and entered into respiratory distress. Now, <laughs> I went back to God and I told him and I said, you are going to make me angry because this is not the agreement we had. I do not want to have to keep going to hospital. I do not want to have to keep going from doctor to doctor trying to find a solution when a whole me is supposed to be a nutritionist. And in that argument with God, or in that, because as far as I'm concerned, I was arguing with God. He may not have seen it as an argument, but I was arguing with God. 
when I mentioned that statement that a whole nutritionist, I then asked myself, but come, wait first. What is even doing you? This is the profession that you practice and you are giving other people advice. Maybe it's time you listen to your own advice. And at this point in my daughter's life, we had gone from every kind of antibiotic you can think about um, to the point where I was now a non-compliant parent because I, I would go to hospital, they would give us antibiotic and I would just throw it away because I was like, enough is enough, you know? So I would just cover her with the blood of Jesus. She would cough, cough, cough. We would rest. In three weeks, we would go back again. It was like a beautiful cycle. The hospital was always happy to see me. <laughs> um, but then the respiratory issues were not getting any better and they were too reoccurrent. At first, I thought, okay, maybe it's something in the house, so I tried to take clothes away from the house. But then again, the spirit said, you are not missing. And so I said, okay, oh, what am I not listening to? I just told you that my daughter liked anything in the form of milk, like milk, anything. And I said to myself, this child probably consumes at least 60 meals of regular formula a day. She probably takes yogurt at least every other day and she probably eats a dairy product every other day when i have when i was going to the hospital so that i don't lose track of what i was trying to explain to you when i was going to the hospital i was always arguing with them right that you guys haven't figured out what's going on i've tried all the things you said i should try it's not working out and what i was failing to do as a parent was i had not looked inside her in terms of what was wrong because i refused to agree that it was an allergic reaction because it wasn't something that was immediate right so i had failed to do the research to find out what could be causing this kind of association and which is the point i was trying to get at with you you see that our inability to to remove the parent's cap and put on the professional cap is really hard especially when you can physically see your child going through so much distress and you can't do anything about it. But the moment I made that switch, all, when I say all, all my problems went away. I took it away with such a grievance that at the time at which I took it away, I didn't even replace it. I just removed it. <laughs> I just removed dairy from my diet. Um, and then I started looking for a replacement. And in looking for a replacement, I needed a replacement that was sustainable for me. I needed something that I could buy in Nigeria that I could keep buying. And I ended up with baobab. Now, baobab is a giant fruit that grows, I think, in the northern regions of Nigeria. It looks exactly like milk. It doesn't taste like milk. But hey, I was not looking for taste. I was looking for solution. Which leads me to my next point. You need to make sure that in making the switch, you are not looking at the child's feelings. Yes, I know as parents, we want to please our children. We don't want them to feel lost. We don't want them to feel lack. But if you find out about an allergy early enough, I plead with you, don't be looking for tastes. The child will get used to it and they will get accustomed to it. Because what you are going to have to be explaining to the child later on is how, because you are looking for taste, they cannot eat half of the things that they should have been eating when they were younger. So if you find it out early enough, remove taste from your mind. Like I mentioned, baobab is not sweet. It doesn't taste like milk. Um, it looks like it, but it doesn't taste like it. So I had to look for ways to sweeten it. And we, <clears throat> we literally use it with everything. We use it as we used to take it with cereals and we used to take it with so many other things. But like I said, it was that, that inability for me to separate parent and professional that cost me, I don't know how much it cost me, and so many sleepless nights. So in seeking the help that you want to seek, in trying to find a solution on your own, separate parent from professional. Like, go into the realm of, let me go back and be a student. Let me go back and start reading things. Let me start asking appropriate questions. Because let me, let me tell you, eh, as a professional, I know how many DMs I get. They may not tell you, I will tell you. It is annoying when somebody comes to me and asks me, um, my child is allergic to milk. Please, what can I give to replace milk in their diet? 
And I'm like, okay, how do you know it's an allergy? And they were like, eh, I noticed that every time I give it, they, they, they don't sleep well. And I'm like, huh? I don't, what? What does that mean? And then I have to spend maybe another 10 minutes in my DM trying to get you to understand the difference between an allergy and intolerance. And by the yeah. end of the conversation, we find out that it's, an, it's actually an intolerance. And it's not even milk per se. It's just maybe the quantity you need to take a step back from. It's, see, I'm a patient person when it comes to trying to understand your children and trying to help you. A lot of professionals are not like that. So the, the speed they will use to brush you off when you come with very open-ended questions like that is alarming. And then you end up feeling like nobody wants to help you or there's no solution. Yeah. That's not it. It's the fact that we want to help you, but you also need to be able to help yourself. So I'm grateful for platforms like this that Nkechi is, is, has created because we give you this kind of information for free so that when you do now need to come for the help that you're seeking, at least you make the work easier for both of us so that good progress can be made, okay? Like, for example, um, I had a patient who believed that milk was giving her children rashes and she just found out about it. Lo and behold, that long, um, um, along the line, because I had her do a food blog for me, it wasn't milk. Guess what it was? It was scabies that somebody had brought into her house. If I had not told her to do a food blog, wow. she would have on her own removed milk from wow. her children's house. So wow. I think it's really, really, really important that you do your research. You see a food log, it's, it's paramount to being able to find an allergy or an intolerance. When you keep a food log, you might not even need a professional to tell you this is what it is. And then in trying to replace it, you might not even again need a professional to tell you this is what it is. So I feel like just with those points, I feel like I sort of have covered a large... Um, demographic of things um can you let me know if i've missed out or anything or if there's a particular question that i haven't answered so so far you have touched on the general you know issues that we have general uh, challenges we have concerning our children's allergies you've made it clear that when you're replacing when you're replacing food you shouldn't see it as um food replacement or replacing a food that has the, um, what's the word now, that has the use, you're not replacing the use of that food. For example, exactly. milk is for cereal. You're not replacing yeah. the use of milk, you're replacing the nutrients. So it might not be in the form of milk that you're used to, but be more interested in the nutrients that you're replacing. Then. I also um, was very, very, the intolerance bit that you shared was very insightful. You said that it's uh, a digestive response and that it might take time to manifest. So can you share with us how it might manifest? What are the symptoms that it might manifest in later on? Okay, so the symptoms between an intolerance and an allergy are practically the same thing so like i gave the story of my daughter because i didn't want it to be about me and my children um but ours is an intolerance because she can take baked goods um and she can take um what's it called she can actually lick ice cream the iron but we can't do it every day the moment we start doing it every day i find myself in the hospital so it's clear from that example that it's like a build-up now the thing with certain proteins which Funnily enough, that's actually what an allergic response is. It's response. It's responding to like the protein in it. So like the, the immunoglobin. That's what they're called. Immunoglobin. So you have IgE, you have IgA, you have IgG, and all that. And the ones that are really related to allergies are called the IgE. So what is being attacked in an allergy is usually the IgE. However, when it comes to intolerances, intolerances you might be reacting to the fact that your system cannot even digest that food over a period of time. Okay? So you cannot be eating it in accumulation. So you can't be eating it every day or every other day. You can eat it once in a while and not have a bad reaction to it. 
or you might end up eating it four times in a row and then have a bad reaction and some people <clears throat> sorry and some people um can eat it today and have a bad reaction by tomorrow morning right bad reaction can be bloating um bad reaction can be can you hear me now is it louder sorry my yes it's know. louder now a bit dry so okay um so bad reaction can be bloating bad reaction can be um hives right so like people who have atopic dermatitis it can be like hives or dryness of the skin um it can be discoloration as well um and then it can be somewhat i don't want to call it diarrhea because that's not really what it could be but you will find yourself going to the bathroom more than often um so very similar the one thing that you will not get in um what's it called hello kids heart the one thing that you will not get in intolerance is you won't have an anaphylaxis anaphylaxis is where your throat closes up and when your throat closes up you it's now between a life and death kind of situation also something else you won't get in the intolerances is you won't get swelling you won't get a lot of swelling you won't see like parts of your face just swelling up or your eyes puffing up things like that that because again like i mentioned it's more related to your bowel your digestive system so if you might you might go to the toilet more often than needed you might not even go to the toilet as often as you usually do you might hear your stomach rumbling like no tomorrow um you might find yourself you might even throw up right that's really the difference so like i said allergic reactions are much severe you almost immediately can see the person's eyes going red their eyes watering or you might see swelling and if it's as bad as it can get you might see um an episode of anaphylaxis which honestly speaking if you have a child in that category my heart goes out to you because the fear is not when they are with you the fear is when they are not with you. yes and which leads me <coughs> which leads me to the next part which i think um is really really important educating the child no matter how small they are once communication is there and once you know that you're going to they are eventually going to be out of your care please 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 let them know if they are as young as 2 as young as 3 sit with them and tell them you cannot have this the reason why you cannot have this is because of this this can happen to you then if there are elder people in their care or adults in their care we are definitely in schools to have that conversation with them again because and if lactis takes away from one of like that it it doesn't even you don't need 5 minutes especially if that person is not equipped with like an epinephrine pen or like an epi pen or the injection it goes like that so having that conversation is really 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 important with the child no matter how young they are let them know they can have this or can have that okay one question so what the physical symptom you see that tells you that this child is having anaphylaxis anaphylaxis yes yeah what's the physical symptom that you see because you know for children who are not verbal they might not tell you this is what's happening to them but how do you find out so one of the first things you would notice they would start off by coughing um and then you would notice that they are struggling to breathe and then almost immediately their face goes red and then it will start turning blue because oxygen is not getting in anymore and then they can start heaving they can start heaving so those are usually the typical signs that you would see if someone is having an anaphylaxis attack but the moment you see coughing that should be a sign that something is not going right at the moment they start heaving you need to do something about it immediately Yeah th- thank you so very much so this is not just for your own child this is also as an adult wherever yeah. you are you see a child wheezing heaving coughing don't just ignore you know find out you might be saving that child's life uh um one of the guests will be having um sometime this month lost a sister 
to anaphylactic, you know. So please watch out and be helpful. Um, somebody is asking me, does it come with a fever? No, it doesn't. Anaphylaxis is not... A, a fever would happen when the body's immune system has been fighting something for a long time. That's usually when you have a fever. If you've ever noticed, if you've ever paid attention to children that catch a cold, the moment they start off with a cold and they're just coughing that slight cough um, and uh, what's it called, and maybe their nose is running, that's not when the fever kicks in. Fever kicks in when the mucus gets thicker and the color changes. So if somebody is having an anaphylaxis attack, you're not going to see a fever happening there. Yes, thank you. Living with atopic um, eczema, yes. Um, you, the person would also have swollen lips as well. But sometimes they may not. It's really dependent on the way the body, the way the immune system is responding to, to that attack. Yeah, what's the first aid to give to a child or anyone who is presenting those symptoms? An epinephrine pen. You need... The, in fact, I don't even know how best to describe it, but the first episodes are not always as severe as the ones moving forward, especially if you catch them early enough. But you need to have an epinephrine pen in your home. Now, how do you even determine if somebody is going to have an anaphylaxis attack? Look at your family history. Sometimes we like to assume that allergies just fell from the sky somewhere. A long family history, and I'm not talking about you and your spouse. I'm talking about grandma, grandfather, great-grandfather, aunties, uncles. Somebody along the line has been presenting with some kind of allergic reaction. It is so essential that you find that out um, and make those inquiries. Even before you get married to someone, make some of those inquiries. I know those are not the typical conversations that we have, but, but do make those inquiries. Like just before I got married to my husband, he didn't know that I was asthmatic. I had to tell him. Um, he always used to laugh and say, There's, um, you're always having a cold. I'm always seeing you always have a cold. Is it that you and cold are best friends? So I told him that, yes, that, you know, asthma comes with, like, seasonal allergies. It's kind of the gift that keeps on giving, the gift we don't like. Um, but having that at the back of his mind sort of, like, prepped him with, with what was going on with our daughter. In fact, I have cousins who have anaphylaxis, like, really, really bad. So they walk around with an EpiPen all the time. Um, so, you call, you call it EpiPen. Epi can, can you spell yeah. that, please? So it's E P I P M. E P I then pen P E N, or okay. epinephrine pen. E P I P H I N R I N E pen. So epinephrine is kind of like um, we have epinephrine in our body. What is epinephrine again? Oh. Is why I need to be reading my biology books before I come for the <laughs> It's related to the fight or flight stimulation in the body, right? It sort of mm -hmm. like jumpstarts the body. So when you put in epinephrine pen, when you inject someone who has an anaphylaxis attack with an epinephrine pen, essentially what it tells the body is, oh yeah, loosen up. You are too tight. You are too, you know, it sort of causes your blood, your blood vessels to dilate opens up your lungs and things like that. So that's essentially what um, the epinephrine pen does, sort of, you know, stops the whole reaction from continuing. So in the absence of epipen, is there any, any other first aid? For, for anaphylaxis right now, not that I know of. Um, you can give an antihistamine to help to sort of... Um, um, what's the word? Slow down the effect of the reaction. It's not going to stop it. It would slow it down long enough for you to be able to get the person to like a hospital or something. So yes, antihistamines would help that because it's actually histamine that is causing that reaction. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even want to get into the science of it, but just know that histamine is what is causing that aggressive reaction. And so an antihistamine brings down the levels of histamine in the blood, calms it down, brings it down, and then helps the body to sort of recover slowly. So you would notice that somebody who has maybe gets a swollen lip or swollen eye or starts itching, the moment you administer an antihistamine, you give that person maybe within the next hour or so, 
the symptoms begin to go down. That's yeah. kind of what will happen with somebody who has anaphylaxis if you give them, um, what's it called? If you give them an antihistamine. However, you need to catch it on time because remember, the place that is being blocked is the throat and the airways. Yeah. And most of the antihistamines we have are oral. And that's why the epinephrine is an injection because it goes straight into the bloodstream. So it can help, but you kind of want to just, I mean, literally rush the person to the hospital. In fact, with the way our healthcare system is set up, oh. I just pray and pray. That's why I said my heart goes out to people who have children who are <laughs> black in Nigeria. Oh. Oh. And I'm glad you also mentioned that these symptoms or when it's starting off, it's not as severe as when it continues to occur. So as parents, when your child reacts to a certain food, you, you, you have to watch it. You watch it. You speak to a child nutritionist. You watch it so that it doesn't continue to occur. Let me just give um, a personal experience. So one, some time ago, we were tidying up my kitchen. So we brought out everything in the kitchen. And one small human being that was supposed to be somewhere <laughs> found his way to the jar of Milo. I just heard someone coughing. <laughs> and he was still licking. <laughs> oh my! I got him, took the Milo away. He kept coughing. The next thing, his mouth said, swelling up and he was coughing next to himself and you know when he threw up what came out was so little very little you know just a strip on the on, on, on what he threw out you know so thankfully we had antihistamine in the house we applied cold compress on the places swelling up and and he was fine so now Milo we don't even buy again because you do not then there have been episodes where I eat yogurt and he touches my plate and that's it. And that's it. So if I must eat yogurt, I'll wait for him to sleep. I'll wait for him to sleep and I'll eat and wash my plate. Then we make sure that we don't use the same plate for eggs, the same plate for yogurt. Uh, for for his own food, we try to separate those plates to ensure that there's no cross contamination. So I believe uh, you tell us these are also the little things that we can do. Definitely. To... Um, and I like the fact that you gave Milo as an example because, honestly speaking, we do not read labels. In fact, I'm seeing a series. I think sometime this month, and. What I have found out even shocked me <laughs> because I was, you know, technically what the, what the show is about is I'm supposed to be reading labels and explaining the content. And some of these items are things I wouldn't typically buy. So I was just buying them to help people out. And as I'm reading the labels, I'm like, these things are in plain sight. But we don't read. We don't pay attention. Let me give an example. Um, you buy milk, right? And your child is allergic to nuts. And the company that makes milk also makes nuts. And on the label, they write it very clearly to me. Allergens contain milk and maybe granules. But because we are buying milk, for the life of God, we need, why should there be nuts anywhere? Right? And then your child takes it and they start having a reaction. And you are puzzled, you are frustrated, and you are actually losing your mind. It was there. It's always been there. We've just not read it. So I think, again, it comes back to really paying attention to what you bring into your home. In fact, just like you just mentioned now, with the whole, you know, having to separate things. I wish I could even do that. I don't even know the, the energy or the strength I have. In our house, if we find out something is not great for somebody, everybody in the house is not going to eat it. Everybody should just rest. Because I can't, sometimes I can't control it, right? I may eat yogurt now and fall asleep and drop it somewhere and somebody will go and pick it up. 
you know. And I know that some of us are not as careful. Let's not let's not even kid ourselves. Some of us are not as careful. So if you know you're on that table with me and you know you're not going to be as careful, either you keep it in in in, in fact in Kilimanjaro where you have to climb tables and stools and open and unlock doors and do all those things to it before you can bring it out. Don't even bother bringing it into your home for you, for your children, for whoever it is. Um, I think that's really important. And then that reading labels, please read your labels. I, I had this argument with somebody who said the biscuit her child is eating does not have meat and her daughter is allergic to it. And I found myself spending 15 minutes explaining to her that it's clearly written on here that it contains whole wheat. She said, a eh, whole wheat is different from wheat product. <laughs> I was just like, at this point in our lives, <laughs> there's no need for me to be stressing. This is all I can tell you. And it wasn't even a consultation. I was just, she was in the supermarket and she asked me a question and I answered. Mm. And my shopping entered from five minutes running into the store to 15 minutes trying to explain to someone that whole wheat and wheat are the same thing. So if I give you um, white bread and wheat bread, having to explain that, I know that it's not her fault. But if we actually did a little bit more work in terms of trying to read and understand things, because the internet is loaded with information. It is an overload of information, yes, but it's loaded with information. Just taking the time out to, in fact, I do this sometimes, and I recommend that um, um, people do it as well. What I recommend is anytime you're in the supermarket and you have to buy something that's in a packaging, pick it up and quickly turn the back. Always be with your phone. Then just quickly, if something doesn't really make sense to you, quickly look it up and see what it is. Because there are some things that um, are not always written out as plain as day. I'll give an example. There's something called gliadin, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of gliadin, did you? Uh -uh. Okay, so gliadin is in the family of, of gluten. And it, be, it can be added to things like um, buckwheat, it can be found in... What did he do? Turned off my inverter, so if light goes, no internet for me. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I have to scream. Oh, my goodness. Odin, oh Odin, Odin, out. Oh, my goodness, these children. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so I was saying that um, you know, gliadin is in the family of gluten. Yes, yeah, so it is him. You saw him. Gliadin is in the family of gluten, right? And it can be found in things like rye. It can be found in things like buckwheat, which are grains that don't contain gluten, that don't contain wheat, right? So I think it's really, really important that we go ahead and we make sure that we're reading labels and just look things up. Look okay, things right. Up. Is it R Y E? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So rye contains gliadin. I think buckwheat also contains gliadin. But there are some people that are okay with gluten and are not okay with gliadin. And there are some people that are okay with gliadin and are not okay with gluten. So again, like I said, it's really important for us to be able to just read those labels so that you know um, what, you're, what, what, you're, what you're giving and how you're even giving it. Yeah. So basically, like I've heard you say once or twice, if you don't understand the English on the nutritional label, just leave it. Just leave it. Happier. It's better to be safe than sorry. Yes, just leave it. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not. So this is a very interesting question. We've had conversations around this. She says, how do you cope with a child with allergies? And wait for it, also a picky eater. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> so again, I think it comes back to the fact that... Um, thank you. You're cheering me on. <laughs> so I think it comes back to something that's really, really important. And I think I started off by saying this. Um, when you are replacing food items, replace them by the nutrients and not the food item. 
Now, picky eating is every child. I'll say that again. Picky eating is every child. We have abused, abused, and abused that word. You, Nkechi, are picky with food. I, Ifi, am picky with food. The definition of picky means selective about certain things that we eat. What are you as a parent supposed to do? Identify the child's feeding language. Understand who the child is in terms of how they like to eat their food. Do they like food that is savory? Veer towards that direction. Do they like salty food? Veer towards that direction. And when I say salty food, I don't mean any salt. They are foods that contain natural sodium in them. For example, things like crayfish, things like yuru, things like scent leaf, um, what else contains natural sodium? Um, um, even okwe, so many things that we consume actually contain natural sources of sodium. Fish on its own, if you get fresh fish, you will taste the salt inside. So, is that the umami? Yes, that umami taste, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then there are some children that like savory foods, right? Then there are also some children that like savory, um, um, blended smooth foods. There are people that like blended smooth foods as well. There are children that like semi-blended that includes objects in it. So they want to be able to see the object, but they only want That's to eat the smooth <laughs> You yeah. need to understand who the child is that you are feeding. The moment you identify who you are feeding, half of your eating problems go away. The moment you don't figure it out, you're not going to get very far because you will keep buying and they will keep refusing. You will keep buying and you keep making and you'll be frustrated. And then there's also the picky eating phases. There are children that, that pick food in phases. Today, right, they may like eating beans just fine. Next week, they will decide they don't want to eat beans, but if you give them more and more, they will eat the more and more. That is something you need to be able to understand. And yeah. the moment you catch a child in any of those phases, adapt to it. Don't be rigid and don't say, oh, they, 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 they used to like eating beans before, now they don't want to eat beans anymore. That's not true. You just haven't figured out the phase that the child is in. There are also children that, um, there are also children that, um, what's it called, that want to, um, for example, they want to eat food in, in large quantities, right? And you, you are trying to give them different variants. Maybe every two, two hours you bring food, they reject it. You are doing yourself. The child has already explained to you that I like to eat food in large quantities. And then there are also children that want to eat things off your plate. But you've been trying to buy all the fancy plates in the supermarket. They want to eat from the plate you're eating. So understanding the child's feeding language really does solve a lot of problems. Here. Thank you so much. Our time is up. Thank you so much. If you have any question, ask and then we'll do another live or maybe